You know, there's uh, most people that are Christians in America live for this world. The Bible says we are tent dwellers and we're passing through. <clears throat> we're just passing through. And uh, um, this world, there'll be trub trouble in it and tribulation. But be of good cheer, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. God's nature and his character doesn't change because the world changes and the earth changes. We're not of the world, we live in the world. We're light in darkness. And God has a plan and a purpose for our life. And it's not that we be weaklings and crawl into heaven, holding on, holding the fort down, as it were. But we be penetrators of darkness with light that we raise godly children that will impact the culture, godly grandchildren. <clears throat> Interesting thing that's happened to me is now that I have grandchildren, <clears throat> I find myself praying more for whatever reason. I don't understand it, but not only for my kids, but the grandkids. I kind of understand my grandmother who prayed and prayed and prayed, and my mom who's a prayer warrior, and uh, it, it makes a huge difference. And um, if you weren't able to be here this week, when Monday through Wednesday, I would encourage you to go listen to the messages. They are online. You can pull up the history. So if you go to the bottom of our website, <clears throat> and for those visiting, the easiest way to remember, because we, we actually bought a new domain that connects to the newhopeassembly.org. It's just it's easier to remember, newhope.church. And uh, if you go to newhope.church, it'll take you to the newhopeassembly.org site. You go to the bottom of the page, and you click on a live stream our service or something like that, and it'll take you to a page that has a history, and you can pick whatever sermon in the past that's there. And if you, some of you, because you're, uh, you're watching online, because I know that if you're wise, you have certain, uh, dis not disability, but a certain, uh, you have to be extra careful because of walking on slick spots, you know. Sometimes, you know, most of us can get out and come to church. It's not bad at all, but uh, it might make sense for some who have chosen to watch online or, or, or who are going to watch online later. You know, we welcome you. <clears throat> the message I bring this morning, I don't want to be misunderstood as a message of you're saved by works or what you do. But the Bible does say in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace are you saved through faith, that it's not of yourselves. It's grace through faith. And faith, when you break it down, uh, Pastor Austin preached a great message and, and, and looked at the root of that, and it's really to trust and obey. Uh, James said, uh, you believe, you do well, the demons believe also. Belief doesn't do it. It's faith, show me your faith by the works that you do. In other words, to change your heart. Um, one favorite preacher of mine, Southern Baptist preacher of mine, used to say, if your religion doesn't change you, you need to change your religion. There's something wrong because God's in the heart-changing business. And uh, our, our world desperately needs a church that's a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb, a church of power, a church with the gifts truly working through in miraculous ways through his people to impact the world. A church that goes into the world and is not afraid to share, but share the gospel and share Jesus with the wisdom of God and the love of God and directed by the Spirit and communicating the way that, that, uh, that God wants us to communicate and not... not uh, not turning them away from a form of religion. Uh, the, the, the people that followed every letter of the law in the Old Testament were, were the sect of Pharisees that were legalistic and they didn't, they didn't have God in their heart. And uh, Jesus speaks of that particular piece of the Pharisees uh, as not, not being what God wants. So I'm going to talk about a subject that some of you may not know what the word means, and it's sanctification. And... Uh, we know righteousness. The righteousness is something we grow into, but also a position we stand in. 
He, Christ Jesus, is my righteousness. Our righteousness on our own is like filthy rags. In other words, if, if we try to say, God, here's all my goodness, I deserve heaven, he's going to look at that as a filthy gift, and you're not ever going to get there. But through the blood of Jesus, it cleanses us. When God looks down upon you, he sees you clean because the blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for our sin, the death that Christ paid, paid for your sin and makes you Though your sin was like crimson, red, and your sin was great, he makes you white as snow. He removes every sin as far as his east from the west. And that's righteousness. But sanctification is another word. And here's what I believe. I'm going to make a startling statement for any of you that might be theologians. There's no righteousness unless there's the process of sanctification and happening in your life. What you have, you have taken the theology and formula of salvation and the definition of grace and mercy and forgiveness, and you've applied it to yourself wrongly. It's why Jesus said, in that day, many of you will say to, to me, but Lord, Lord, we've prophesied in your name. We've done wonderful works in your name, and Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because there's so many people running around knowing about God, but not knowing God. There's so many people running around that have the formula of salvation, the definitions of grace, the definitions of mercy, and all the things, man, they're not saved at all. And the reason you know they're not saved is because there's something wrong in their heart. There's something wrong there. There's something wrong. There's no fruit. There's no, there's no proof of that salvation. There's no proof of the work of God. So you say, well, Pastor, what is sanctification? Well, sanctification, you can have moments of sanctification, like a moment that catapults you, okay? Like when you get saved, the Holy Spirit, you cry out. He can deliver you from things. You know, I've seen people come to Christ be delivered from alcoholism or drugs or many other things. Or I had a friend, a very good friend of mine share that on, on, on one week he was driving and he shared with me in a moment that God revealed something and took it away. And it was a moment, a revelation moment that really helped him and catapulted him forward in his spiritual journey. But it's also a process. You see, sanctification is a process of becoming like God, becoming holy. It's a process of becoming holy. Uh, it is something we grow into more and more. And it involves separation from sin, but that's not it because that's just religion. It's not just separation from sin. But when you repent, you turn from sin and you turn toward God. It's separation from sin unto God, set apart unto God, for God. That's what uh, holy, that's what sanctification does. And we know it, the Hebrew writer is very important, this whole thing about being holy. So, we're, so, we're, so, the, so the word you'll hear me use a lot today is holiness and holy because we have to be in process with God's word and spirit changing us from the inside out by the power of Jesus Christ and his spirit and through the word of God to make us a holy people. You have been called out of darkness into his glorious light. You are a, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a peculiar, different than those in the world. We're not of the world. This world is not our home. We are God's people, children of God. And the Hebrew writer wrote in Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort. Notice effort. It doesn't just happen. God comes in, you cooperate with it. You, let, you listen to his voice. You examine it. You put off the old things. You put on the new things. It takes... Uh, 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 a, a willingness, a heart willingness, and God will help change your heart, but you have to, once he does, start applying yourself. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Make every effort to live in peace and make every effort to be holy. Without holiness, no, no one will see the Lord. You see how important that is? What does it say? It says, just believe in Jesus, you'll see the Lord. To say, by grace, grace will get you to the Lord, grace will get you to heaven, no. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Well, how can you say that if we're saved by grace? If, how do you say it? Because when grace saves you and Jesus comes into your heart, he works the work of sanctification, the process to make you a holy people, to change you. 
If it doesn't change you, Adrian Rogers, if your religion doesn't change you, you need to change your religion. Jesus wants you to be a holy people. God wants you to be a holy people, and the Word of God makes it plain throughout Scripture, both the Old and the New. Both the Old Testament and the New. So Jesus prays in John 17. If you take your Bibles, if you have them, look at John 17. It's a prayer of Jesus. And he's praying for his disciples, and he's praying for us here, all of you right here. Do you know that Jesus prayed for you? He prayed for you. Look at this. John 17, 17 and 23. Sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. The word. Sanctified. The process of becoming holy. Without the word, you're not going to grow holy. Without the word, you're going to still live in the flesh and live weak. And you might make it to heaven by the skin of your teeth. I'm, I'm not your judge. But God wants us to be sanctified. He's praying for his disciples, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world, this disciples. So they need to be sanctified. They need to be a holy people. For them, look at this, Jesus says, for them, Father, he's praying to his Father, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Why is he saying that? Is that that verse somewhere up there? It's, It's not there. Oh, I didn't put it in. I'm sorry. You got your Bible? You better look at it. He says, For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. It's because the way we become sanctified, the way we become holy, is God in us. If Jesus He's a man on earth. If he's not holy, when his spirit comes and Christ comes within us, if he's not holy, how do we become holy? He becomes, we become holy because the Holy One lives in us. See? That's why he says, he he prays to his Father. He says, for them I, I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. Okay, not just my disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. How about that? We're believing because the disciples went and preached the gospel to others who preached the gospel, who preached the gospel, and it was passed down. He's praying for us right there. Have you believed the message? That all of them may be one. Now, he wants us to be one. Do you understand that as a spiritual family? I mean, as a parent, do you want your kids hating each other? Do you want them bickering? Do you want them loving each other? Do you want them unified? Do you want them undermining? You know? I I was at a playground here a couple weeks ago, and this one kid was playing his his uh, little little littler sister and being mean. And no, the little sister was playing the older brother, and and then she would she would point the finger at him, trying to get him in trouble, and start crying and pointing. And she was doing she was a little little stinker. She needed she needed Jesus bad. I'm telling you, she's only two. She just doesn't quite get it. But I'm telling you, <clears throat> she was divisive. I don't want that for my kids. He says that, verse 21, he says that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I'm in you. Just as we are one. I'm in you and you are in me. Now watch. And he says, may they also be in us, Father, you and me. May the people be in us that the world may believe that you've sent me. I have given them the glory. What is that? The holiness, the spirit, the glory of the Lord, the power of God. I have given them the glory that you gave me. The same glory that the Father gives the Son, Jesus passes on to us, and that's the Holy Spirit and the power of God and the Word of God and the glory of God in our lives that people will see something in us different. The glory of the Lord would shine upon your face, right? May the glory of the Lord be in your life. And it comes through the holiness of God. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. You see, when God is in us, he produces holiness. So the more of God, the more of heaven we get. The more we go after God, the more we're filled with his spirit, the more we're like him. And God is holy. And without holiness, no man will see God. For God is holy. And we are his holy people, the children of God. 
So let's break down. What do I mean holy? When you process, the process to get holy is sanctification. We're being sanctified. And the means he uses is the, starts with the word. And Jesus prayed it. Remember, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Why do you think the devil fights devotion? Why do you think he fights opening the Bible? Why do you think he fights memorizing the Bible? Because there's power here, my friend. Right? There's power here. It's like Psalm 1. Meditate in thy law day and night. You'll be like a tree planted by the water. You shall not be moved. Meditate upon it. Chew upon it. Put it in your heart. Hide it in your heart. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word is like a, a light unto my, a lamp unto my feet so I can see for the immediate, but I can also, it's a light to my path and I can see. The Word of God, folks, is what begins the process of sanctification. That's what Jesus prayed. So what does it look like? What does holiness look like? Well, it includes a deep desire to pursue God. God puts the desire in our heart. Bill Gothard said that when grace invades, grace isn't just a definition, it's the power of God that invaded your heart. And when grace invades your heart, it changes your desire and gives you a power to live out. He doesn't change your desire to be a holy people. He doesn't change your desire to be strong and to live for him and be an overcomer and then live you weak and frustrated so you can't do it. You don't have to remain captive to bondage and to sin and to strongholds. His same spirit that put this word, put God, Jesus in Mary, his spirit come upon you and he'll put that living word in you. Christ Jesus, the living word, and these words will come alive and be powerful in you that you can be an overcomer and you can be a holy person. It's a deep desire. He puts it in your heart and he gives you ability to follow out your desire. He doesn't leave you powerless. And it's, it's a pursuit to obey God. It's a pursuit to obey Jesus and everything Jesus said. It shows forth by our love for each other and our unity. You know that? Do you know Paul prayed? Paul, rather, in every one of his books, emphasizes the unity of the brothers and not divisiveness. And that's what Jesus said, too, that they might be one like, Father, you and I are one, because that's one of the signs. They will know you are Christians by your love. It means we give our tithe and our offerings to God with great joy. The Bible says when it mentions tithe, pay. But that's a law, yeah. That's right. It was part of the law. Pay the tithe. But it also, the law included offerings. And Jesus crossed every T and dotted every I. But he took it further. And he said, it's not enough just to pay your tithe. Everything you have belongs to me. And if I ask for the other 90%, you give it. And you know where the tithe belongs? It doesn't belong to a district. It doesn't belong to a parachurch organization. It doesn't belong wherever you think you want to give. It belongs to the local church because that's the only, only institution Jesus established is the church, the glorious church, without spot or wrinkle, the church of Jesus Christ. And leaders are very responsible for that. You know, when I set this church up, and I didn't say this earlier, sir, but I feel led to say it, so I can't see who gives what because I don't want to know. Because that's just opening the door to the enemy to work on my mind to go, well, this person gives a lot. I better just let them do whatever. Or this person doesn't give anything and I'm going to be harsh or I'm not going to care. And I don't want to know. I flat do not want to know. But I want to tell you, whoever you are, if you make $10, one belongs to God. And the Bible says if you don't give it, you're robbing God. And you're blocking the blessing of God. I believe it with all my heart and I've practiced it. I believe it. And that might be an area of holiness that you need to get underneath God's authority on. And not only the tithe, but offerings to God. And it says they gave joyfully. I mean, your heart needs to be changed where when you give and you bless others and you give the missions and you give the benevolence, that you're giving joyfully. It's a joy to give instead. Of, all they want is money. All they want is money. No. All God wants is your whole life. And your money's a part of it. You don't like it? I didn't write it. Thank you, Lord, for helping me there. I had some other thoughts going through my mind. It also means we're not only given, but we're forgiving. We're merciful and gracious and loving. That's who God is. Holiness is kind. 
Holiness is gentle and patient. Holiness is self-controlled and faithful and pure. Holiness endures all things and keeps hope in the midst of all the trouble and sorrow in the world and the evil. It keeps hope. Holiness is produced by God in us and flows through us to the world and brings conviction. God sent His Holy Spirit. His first name is Holy. His Holy Spirit to make us holy. And the fruit of the Spirit is holy fruit. Are you with me? That's holiness. Holiness, though, is more than just not sinning because that's legalism. That's, that's uh, looking at you, and, and you're going to get proud in yourself if you go, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin. And, and yes, there's religions that, 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 are, that are manipulated and beat down and so that a person just says, I'm not going to sin. And, and look at the Pharisees, Jesus pointed the finger because in their hearts they had sin, and privately they were sinful, but Jesus knew it. But on the outside, they crossed every T and dotted every I, they did everything right, but their righteousness was an outward righteousness and not written in the heart. But the Spirit of God that raised you the dead is in you and he will put a, a, a tender heart a heart of flesh in you and put holiness and put God and put right inside your heart God does that it's not just not sinning it's an action of, of, of all of God's nature in and through us his his fruit of the spirit and everything impacting the world around us that's what holiness does the Hebrew writer is saying a true believer is a holy believer be holy for I am holy if it is the Holy One of Israel that is in us, leading us, empowering us, how can we as followers of Jesus not be a holy people? How? Holiness is not jealous. It's not envious. Holiness is not lustful and it's not greedy. It's not proud or self-seeking. Holiness is not angry in a wrong way. There's a righteous anger. Holiness is not critical and judgmental and gossipy and divisive and whispering. Holiness doesn't tear another down to get their way. Not hateful, not violent, not disrespectful. Holiness is not blasphemous. It's not filled with cursing and coarse language and drunkenness. Holiness is not filled with ungodly humor, not filled with bitterness and resentment. Holiness is not revengeful and is not immoral and it's not filled with perversion and vulgarity. Holiness is what's written in this book and you don't want to agree with it? Let me tell you something. It book, this book does nothing. You want to take pages out and say, well, I don't think that's right. I don't feel like that's right. I don't agree with that. Well, that was Old Testament. Let me tell you, God doesn't change. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change where he de describes holiness in the New Testament, he demands it in the Old Testament, and it doesn't change. And you can say, like the po popular people, that you're mean and you don't have love if you s call certain sins sin, and you don't understand humanity. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. <laughs> but the Word of God's not mean, it's true. And being set free from sin changes a person's life. Holiness, my friend, looks like Jesus. The holy child of Bethlehem. And we can live holy. We're not weaklings. And we, we must live holy. Because without holiness, no man will see God. And it starts, number one, in the mind. It starts in the mind. Right here. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober. That sober is like, take, they make this, this is serious business. Taking it very serious, seriously. They're alert, they're attentive with minds. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. In other words, live a life ready. Believe and know that it is the grace of Jesus by which we're saved through faith. And live as if he's going to come and purify yourself. Live a holy people. And look at verse 14. Here's what it's saying. It continues. As obedient children. That's holiness, being obedient. Remember I started off. Holiness obeys God and obeys Jesus. Right? You know, you know the scripture says, that I already say this in this service, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, if I said it, I'm going to say it again. He said, he said uh, you say, the Lord's going to say, get part from me. I never needed to say, but Lord, we've prophesied in your name. Now, have I said this? I pro you prophesied in, 
I, we've prophesied in your name. We've done many wonderful in your works in your name. He go, I didn't know you. You were religious. It can look right. You see, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. You didn't know any better. Now God's light has shined on you. You know better. You got the word of truth to sanctify in you. Don't conform to the evil desires. Let God change your desire. But just as he who called you is holy, just as God who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, the word of God will cause your life to change, your mind to change, to desire holiness. It is written, be holy because I am holy. So where was it written? What is Peter quoting? He's quoting Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 and 45. He said, which says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself and be holy. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Notice the power of grace. Songwriter knew what he's talking about. Let my... Well, I forgot the rest of the words. Something about eyes of faith and my will be drawn to thine. Okay? So, so he says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself to be holy. In other words, commit yourself. Make it your goal because I am holy. Then 45, I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. God wants us to be holy. How many believe God wants you to be holy? All right. In a minute. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and move down here and go after more God because you need more of holiness, bottom line. You need more holiness, people. You hearing me? Less secular, less flesh, less gossip, less critical, less mean, more kind, more patient, more loving, more forgiving, more God character in you. We need it. I need it. You need it. We need more of God, more of heaven, more of his holiness. In James 1, you have your Bible, I don't think it's on the screen, but James 1, it says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That's holiness. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Verse 21, therefore, get rid of all moral forth, faith, uh, filth. That's, that's what we do. We, we have to do something. Get rid of it. Make a point. Make a decision. And call on God to fill you, to help you. And the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. The King James says, instead of humbly accept the word planted in you, which is able to save you, the King James Version says it better. It says, and receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Your brain... When you do things over and over and repeat them, so if we watch television or things that are not right and we don't think they're impacting us, baloney. It's increasing your brain. It's wrinkling your brain. And the more you do something, the more you view something, the more you think that way, the crease gets deeper and deeper and deeper, and it's called a stronghold of the enemy. And he come, comes at you in all kinds of ways. And so when the Word of God comes, it renews our mind. Right? Right? It renews our mind. It starts in the mind. And, and what it does, he's, King James and James is writing, receive the engrafted word. It's like picture of a metal plaque that the engraver engraves on that plate. Like upon your mind, his truth and his word, his law, his commandments. And, 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 and God will reveal that. He'll change your mind. He'll renew. He'll undo those wrinkles and patterns of your brain that make you do certain things. Like when I drive my car, if I'm not thinking, my car goes places I don't want it to go. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I will be driving or going to the hospital, and I'll go right on by. I just keep going on 35 right by the hospitals because I'm on my phone. I'm not thinking about what I'm doing. I'm thinking about the person I'm talking to on the phone as I drive. And I, I've, missed ex, I've, been, I've, mixed ex, I've missed exits, and it's cost me 20 minutes. How many of you ever do that? Your car's going where it wants to go. You're demon-possessed. That's why you need to trade yours in. Get a heaven car. A chariot. <laughs> Pastor Hawkins knows about those fancy car, chariot cars. He knows all about those. Receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. The word soul there is mind, if you look at it. 
He's talking about the mind. But when you look out Scripture and you look in different places, it talks about soul, it's three things. And we know theologically that the soul is mind, will, and emotions. It's mind, will, and emotions. When Jesus comes into your heart, he's coming into your soul to change your thinking, how you feel, how you see things, your emotions. He's changing your thinking, uh, your will so that you choose differently, okay? Helps you to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He's changing you, but it starts in the mind and therefore receive the engrafted word. Folks, get in the Bible. Go to a class on Wednesday night adults. Quit dropping your kids off and running off wherever. Go get in a study and get the word in you and then get a devotion guide and get in the Bible. Get in the Sunday school class. Good teaching happens. Are you mad at me yet? Oh, what are y'all, spiritual masochists? Do you like being yelled at or what? A little of this is not spiritual. It's the flesh. I'm just being honest with you. It's what you called the word F-R-U-S-T-R-A-T-E-D. Frustrated. I'm trying to do this thing that I'm about to read here. In Titus, it says, so, 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 no, let me go on. So do not merely listen. This is James chapter 1, verse 20. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at the, his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, the word, that gives freedom. The word isn't bondage. The word is freedom. It frees you from your sin and from selfishness. And he brings joy and continues in it. Not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. It begins in the mind. It's through the word of God. We need the word. And it changes your will. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 15. Write it on your note card. Titus 2, 11 to 15. It changes your will. Look at this. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no. Say that. Say Say no. No, no. I want you to say Say no. It teaches you to say no. Say no. Say no. This kind of sounds like a foreign word, doesn't it? Say no. No, but say, say no. Let's put a pause in there. Ready? Say no. Loud. I didn't see some of you doing it. Do it again. Say no. You think I'm. Who was it that started the say no campaign? Was that Reagan's wife? Say no to drugs. Doesn't work without God. Say no. That's your will. See, the grace of God invades you. It's the power of God to change your heart. It changes your way you think, your mind. It changes your will. It changes your emotion about everything. God changes and saves your life because the power of God comes into you so that your will can say no. It's not just the human strength, but the power of God, the Spirit of God, the Word of God that can say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing, the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. Look at this word, eager eager to do what is good, not just not do the evil, but do what is good. Holiness separates from sin unto the works of God, unto God, set apart for God, sanctified so that, so that we can be a, a unique, holy people. And then he says, these things are the things you should teach. Those teach, 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 so that people's will is changed, so their mind is affected. Look at this, encourage and rebuke with all authority. With the authority of God's word, I'm rebuking today. Do you feel it? But I'm not meaning just to rebuke, I'm also encouraging, and don't let anyone despise you. In Romans 12, one and two, the New Testament, it tells us this. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Not offer your bodies as eye candy, being immoral and, and dressing all Im, uh, immodest and showing off your stuff. 
wearing short shorts to show off your stuff and low-cut stuff to show off your stuff. That's not what your body is for. You mad at me? It's not what your body's for. Listen, parents, you're not friends to your kids. Your parents, your authority, you can tell them that's inappropriate, take it off. Now, if that's all you do, you're not hearing me, and you think all I'm talking about is what you look like on the outside, you're missing my heart. Because I'm talking about it starts on the inside by the Word of God. Do you get that? The Holy God is in us. That's why Jesus, remember I started off with the prayer. Jesus prayed that they'd be one as we're, one, we're in each other. May they be in us. When Christ is in us, the Holy God comes out in holiness. Is that right? So maybe God isn't in us. We just believe about God. He's over there, and we're looking at him, and we believe, and we count all the blessings, and we're fearful not to believe because we don't want to burn in hell, but we never really got him in our heart to change us. So we don't look like anything like heaven. We don't seek heaven. All we do is bring our religious scorecard to church, and we evaluate the preacher and the singing and everybody else, and we're looking outward. We never look inward, but the Holy Spirit always looks inward to bring holiness and outward to bring salvation, mercy, grace, and love and forgiveness, and to speak the truth as the Spirit would give it to us. Amen? So he says, I urge you to... In the view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. It's your spiritual act of worship. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of the world. Quit acting like the world. Quit trying to look like the world. We're not the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Changing the mind. The, the creases engrave the word on your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. See the will? His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You're conformed. If you transform by the renewing of your mind, it begins in the mind, then you'll know the will of God, and you'll have the power to accomplish the will of God. You see, it starts in the mind. It transfers to the will. It changes your will. And thirdly, it produces godly emotions. Now, I told you the soul is mind, will, and emotion. And here's how the world lives and most Christians in the church in America. Here's how they live. Emotions, how they feel, rules what they do. I feel this way. I don't feel that way. I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like reading the Bible. I don't feel like praying. I don't really feel like talking to that person. I know they look lonely. They look lost like somebody else. I don't want to get broiled in that. I feel like this. I feel like that. I feel like I like the younger preachers because they're nicer. I don't blame you. But most of America let emotions rule their thinking and their will. They decide by how they feel. They think on how they feel. Well, I don't feel like that's right. Well, I don't agree with that. I don't, the Bible, God doesn't care what you think. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to man, but the end leads to destruction. God's ways are not our ways. Think what you want to think, but God's the creator, and he's the thinker, and he's the one that said it. Amen? I never understood that. How people to go, well, I know it says that, but that's this, that's that, and throw that out. I mean, come on, if I'm not going to believe the book, I'm going to throw the whole book out. I'm not, I'm gonna, why don't you just be an atheist if you're like that? I don't get it. If the book isn't the authority, then why do you take part of the book as the authority that's going to save you and take you to heaven, but you won't take the other part of the authority that says this is how you ought to live? You tell me that. Anyway, the mind, the thinking has to rule the will and the emotion. So God has to change our thinking, renew our mind, and then align us with his will and give us a heart that we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, let us follow your will. And so God saves our soul, thus he changes our minds. He renews our minds. He leads us to the wisest choices and decisions with our will, thus changing our desire and our will, and then godly feelings happen. You see, godly minds and thinking and godly choices lead to godly emotions. Godly emotions. You ever heard that phrase? I did a lot of reading on different things that are emotions. Some of you, the words I'll use, you'll say, well, that's not an emotion. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You, you just think about it. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. If holiness does not start in the mind and how we think, we will follow our lowest nature and do what feels right. That's what's wrong. Faith 
comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God because the Word of God goes in and transforms our mind and changes our, our will and then heals our emotions. Here's ungodly emotions, unhealthy fear. I'm fear of snake. That's a healthy one, folks. I mean, when you're afraid of that rattlesnake in Texas, that's smart. It's a God-given fear. You're afraid of the cliff. You don't, you know, that's a God-given fear. You're afraid of riding with me. That's a God-given fear. I'm telling you right now. Unhealthy fear. A hateful anger. There's a righteous anger. A self-consciousness and insecurity. Self-focused. See, humility is not to think of yourself as humble. It's not to think of yourself at all. And it's to say, I need you, God. It's not about you. Un ungodly emotions or self-consciousness and insecurity. Worry and anxiety. Worthlessness, the feeling of worthless and inadequate. Feeling resentful and bitter. Feeling arrogant or superior. Feeling uh, jealous or envy, envious. Feeling shame and guilt. Oh, that shame and guilt's there until Jesus comes. But when God has changed your mind and changed your will and saved your heart and saved your soul, the godly emotion will not be shame and guilt because there is no condemnation of those in Christ Jesus. And he sets us free from shame. He sets us free from guilt. And you shouldn't be there. Forgive yourself if God forgave you, if Christ dying on the cross and suffering and shedding his blood is good for anybody else, it's good for you. Get over yourself. Your sins aren't that good. I don't care how many sins you've done. You forgive every one of your sins. Get over it. Forgive yourself. Move on. You can't forgive others till you forgive yourself. Don't walk around with, with guilt and shame. Lostness and loneliness. Emptiness and misery, those are emotions. Feel, I feel miserable, I feel empty, I feel lonely, I feel lost. Those are ungodly emotions. When the Holy Spirit fills you up, folks, when Jesus, when you got more of heaven and God is there, you're not going to have those ungodly emotions. You're going to have these godly emotions. You're going to have godly sorrow that when you sin, there, it leads to true repentance. A godly sorrow for the nation to be like the weeping prophet Jeremiah who had godly sorrow and prayed for their nation. That's godly emotion. Contentment and peace, that's godly emotion. A peacefulness, a gladness and a joyfulness, that's godly emotion. Even in the midst of sorrow, that's godly emotion. A compassion toward others, that's a godly emotion that makes you give. The, an empathy that makes you forgive and putting yourself in someone else's place. And a love, oh my goodness, a love that fills your heart. That's a, that's a feeling, it's, 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 it's a decision to live by, but it's also a feeling. When I see God in people, oh, I love God. And when I, some of you, I see God so much in you, I love you so much, I just want to squeeze the honey out of you. I mean, you got so much God in you, I just love you so much. And some of you have so little of God, I say, God, help me love them. Is that honest? How many of you think that sometimes too? I've been that stinker that you needed help loving. Empathy, love, that's a feeling. Thankfulness, you feel thankful. You feel grateful. Those are godly emotions. A confidence, not an arrogance, a confidence. We know that who we have believed. We're confident in God. A satisfaction, a satisfaction, an inspiration. We feel inspired because God is in us and we feel hopeful. Those are all feelings. Remember the old song, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Sanctuary is where we come to meet with God, the presence of God. Let me, my, my, my in being, let me be a sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. God, let me, that be our prayer. And John, as I close here, John 3, 1 to 3, it says, just as 1 John 3, 1 to 3, it says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. <laughs> oh, I love that. Look at the great love. He lavished. I love that language. Uh, uh, lavished. Wow. Foamed up on us, man. Show, should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We're children of God. The reason that world does not know us is that they didn't know God. They didn't know Jesus. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what will what we will be has not yet been made known. But when we know, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Do you believe Jesus is coming back? He said he was going to come, and he pierced the darkness, sending Jesus Christ into the world. 
He's going to come back just like he said someday. And he's closer than ever before. The signs are all around. And if you believe that, you know, aren't you going, don't you want to be ready? Every morning wake up, God, you want to live holy. You want to live close to God. You want more of God. You want more of heaven. You want to be pure because you want to be looking up. And I mean, the Bible tells us to keep our eyes on the eastern sky, eastern sky where Christ is going to come back from the eastern sky and be expecting his coming. So we need to believe. I, you need the blessed hope. It's a sure hope. Not I hope so hope, but I I know so hope. It's a sure hope that Christ is coming. So let's purify ourselves. Seek more of heaven, folks. Less of us and more of God. And when the Holy Spirit fills us up, he fills us with his holiness. The Holy Spirit. Holiness unto the Lord. We need God, so let's go after God. The songwriter said, when your spirit wind begins to blow, it brings vibrant life to our dry bones. And it lights a raging fire. What does fire do? It burns up dross. It burns away the, 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 the impurities out of the gold. It burns away the, the wood, the hay, and the stubble, the stuff that is worthless. And it brings you up. Then you're like fine gold. It purifies you. And so, and it lights a raging fire, God. Your spirit wind blow, I pray. Light a raging fire in our soul. Lord, we long for you. We long for you. Let our eyes be open to the way you move. Let our ears be open to the sound of truth. Let your spirit break out any way you choose. We don't care, Lord. We just want you. And if you want God, stand to your feet. If you want more holiness, get to this altar. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, call on Jesus and he'll save you. He'll change your heart. He'll change your thinking. He'll change the way you feel. He'll change, he'll change your will so that your will aligns with his will, that his will will be done. As we sing it, let's pray it. Come on. Father God, I just pray right now over this congregation that your spirit would call us the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead oh God take this word give them give them a desire for the word give them a hunger for heavenly things this earth will pass away but your word endures forever may your word come alive the living word Jesus breathe your spirit and make him alive in us us and him and him and us that his holiness might be our holiness, his thoughts might be our thoughts, that we'd feel the way he feels, that our hearts would be in line with his heart. Hallelujah. Let our will, Lord, be surrendered to your will. Give us a new desire, a new work in our heart, God. Invade your people with your spirit, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm going to just ask Todd to, Todd to play over here a moment and and, and then uh, I'm going to ask you just to everybody, just pray right now. Just pray yourself. Just pray, would you? Come on, just call on God. You can do it quietly or out loud. Do whatever you're comfortable with. No one's going to be bothered by it. Okay? You don't have to. We don't want anybody drawing attention where they start screaming out loud and everybody can't focus because someone's so loud. But everybody pray. Come on, right now. Push in because this is the flesh. It's hard. You know, you're looking at the time. The roast beef is calling you. Forget it. You always got time to eat. Come on, let's press in right now and pray and ask God to make you a holy child, peculiar, set apart unto God, from sin and unto God. Would you pray right now? Cry out. Come on. one minute of prayer, one minute. 
you know that your heart is wrong if that one minute seemed long and yet when your songs are being sung you can sing for 10 and it feels like it's just a moment you're about the music and not about the Jesus of the music how long has this been since you knelt and prayed you spent an hour in his presence no music just you and God we're focused on the music we're not focused on God be still and know that I am the Lord take time the old songwriter said take time to be holy take time to be holy for without holiness no man will see the Lord and if you're watching today I'm inviting you to Jesus he'll forgive your sin he'll come into your life if you don't start with Jesus changing your heart and coming in and forgiving you and having a relationship and you decide you're going to be a holy person then you have religion you're no better than the people that Jesus ridiculed so you got to say Jesus forgive my sin and come into my life and change me I want to walk with you I want to have a relationship I want to learn the still small voice when God whispers that I can follow I will follow you Lord with all my heart with faith trust and obedience in Jesus name now may God's spirit close your eyes plant his power and his grace inside you change your desire give you a hunger for his word and make you realize that there's no acceptable way but to be a holy people to quit excusing yourself because the most of Christianity is an ungodly unholy people that talk a cheap talk their lips honor me but their hearts are far from me so we pray God change our heart and may we start walking in the fruit of your spirit the power of your grace God and that Lord our lifestyle says this is different they don't look anything like the world anymore they're all about you Jesus and may our emotions be healed so that we're not a bunch of sad suckers down depressed you know low life people that just our emotions are out of control let the joy of the Lord be our strength as David prayed let the joy of the Lord be our strength and for those that have chemical imbalances and they can't help it to, the, the feeling of feeling low or depressed that's different but I pray healing of those chemicals in the mind because you're the healer too you heal headaches you heal chemical imbalances you heal all things well so bring healing and bring comfort to those that have lost their loved ones parents and brothers and sisters and, and cousins and aunts and uncles in Jesus name we thank you for it everybody said amen amen God bless you